Good afternoon, FICC. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, let's let's do that again. Why don't we all stand up as we begin our praise and worship? Good afternoon, FICC. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Amen. What a beautiful Amen. day we're having, right? Yes. Amen. So many things going on in this world, personally and and uh, in our work lives as well, relationship wise. I'm so thankful for this Sunday that we're able to come to the house of the Lord and just be with Him for the next hour or so and just uh, let's shake off our problems and just leave Him by the door and I pray for the Holy Spirit to anoint us and for just for the evil one to be binded away from us. Amen. Amen. Why don't we uh, go ahead and start our praise and worship and let us sing. Let's uh, get our, our, our voices ready for the Lord. Let's smile. And let's sing together for him. Amen. 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 Let's sing one way. One way. <laughs> There's only one way, one true way, and that is through uh, Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, you kids, this is one of our favorite songs. Are you guys ready to sing? Yes. Amen. Let's make a joyful noise in this room. Let's put our hands together. Amen. One way, and that is to Jesus. Come on, let's sing. I my love down at your feet. You're the only one I need. Turn to you when you are always there. Yes, he is. Come on. Troubled times, it's you I see. I put you first, that's all I need. Humble all I am, all to you. Which way is it? Come on, one way. One way. Jesus. Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way. One way. You're the only one that I could live for. Come on, let's keep those hands clapping. You are always, always there. Every how and everywhere. You grace upon so deep within me. Yes, Lord. Come on. You will never ever change. You will never ever no, change. He won't. Yesterday, today, the same. Never till forever meets the way. Oh, yeah, one way, Jesus. One way, Jesus. You're the only one that I could live for. One way. One way, Jesus. You're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus. You're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus. You're the only one that I could live for. All right, why well, don't we go ahead and say hello to one another. Let's hug one another and welcome one another. Amen. joyful noise you know anytime we're so happy uh, to be a Christian you know that we're saved and we're confident 
And where we stand with our God, the devil absolutely sees us and even more of a target. Amen. Amen. Let us go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes. Let's just quieten our hearts for just a second. Lord, Father, we come with all we have this afternoon. Our bodies, souls, minds are all here to worship you. We have come for a glimpse of your kingdom of kindness, a world where love rules over all, and um, where our enemies embrace one another. There is um, no enemies, just friends, and our foes are evaporating. Lord Father, your name is holy. We are set apart. That, that is why we've come here this afternoon, Lord. In a world where it's becoming so hard to live as Christians, Lord, the word is dictating how we should act and how we should move and the things that we should say and the things that are written in the Bible that we should just disregard and believe in what the world is doing. Lord Father, help us to stand strong and steadfast. Lord Father, you've always been so faithful when we needed you. You've always been there with us. So Lord Father, we call upon your name this afternoon that you would just give us a special a special seismic power called to worship. Lord Father, Father, we believe in your power to change us. You're creating power, making relationships new. You're redeeming power, saving us from despair. You're sustaining power, giving us courage and strength. And in this hour, we sing and we pray and listen together. So Lord Father, we open ourselves to the seismic power of your kingdom, changing our hearts, our lives, and our world. We call upon your most powerful name, Jesus, our Lord God. Amen. 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 So let us continue our praising and worshiping this afternoon. And just, let's dedicate this moment and time. You know, God's anointed, uh, he had already anointed this time for all of us to be in the same space long, long, long ago. And that's what's so amazing about him is that he knows our future and he's already written, this, written it before us. Amen. Amen. Let us sing, My Redeemer Lives this afternoon and just let's make a joyful noise in this room. Let's put our hands together. Put a smile on our face. Our Redeemer lives. Amen. He's alive and well. I know He rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sin. I believe. I believe. Amen. Come on, my shame. My shame is taken away. My pain is filled in His name. I believe.
know, when a whole group comes together and worships, it truly changes the atmosphere and the mood. Amen? Amen. Let us continue our singing this afternoon. Our God. You know, there are many out there in the world that want to forget about our Lord Jesus, the creator of the galaxy and, and the universe. And it's just so, it's so discouraging and disheartening to see these days. Amen? But we have one belief and that is the bible that is um god breathed and so we are here to worship our one true god amen let us continue our singing our god our god is so good come on what a return into wine Open the eyes of the mind, there's no one like you, none like you. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome and power. Our God, our God. Our God. Oh, He is so mighty. Amen. Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you No, there's none like you, God None like you Who is greater? Our God, amen, come on Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome and power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome and power, our God, our God. Amen. 
If our God is for us, who can stand against us? Amen. No man, no military, nobody on earth or even below can stand against us. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Let's continue our praising. This I believe. Come on, let's sing. A Father everlasting, the all creating one. God Almighty. Yes, you are. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son. Jesus, our Savior. Come on, church, I believe. I believe in God, our Father. I believe in Christ, the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name Jesus, I got forever, amen. Amen. All right. Come on, our judge. Our judge and our defender, suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. You're so merciful, Lord God. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Come on. Forever seated high. Come on, I believe. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. That we will rise again For I believe in the name of Jesus I believe, come on I believe in you, Jesus I believe you rose again I believe I believe, yes That Jesus is Lord. Let's say that again. I believe. Come on. I believe in you. Yes, Jesus. I believe you rose again. Amen. And I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in God our Father. Come on, church. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, amen, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus, for I believe in the Father, we believe in you. As we sing this last part, Lord Father, you are so mighty. Yes. I believe in life eternal. Yes. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion. 
and in your holy church I believe come on church I believe when Jesus comes again for I believe in the name of Jesus yes Lord praise you Lord we worship you here this afternoon I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit Our God is three in one I believe in the resurrection That we will rise again For I believe in the name of Jesus Lord, we worship you, Jesus. We believe in your power to change us, Lord. Father, I call upon your name to just be with us, that you would send your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we may have this wonderful time of just listening to your words this afternoon, that we may bless others once we leave this place, Lord. Father, anoint us, open up our ears, our minds, and our hearts, Lord. We praise you, and we're so thankful for you, Lord Jesus. And the church said... Amen. Let's remain standing as we uh, pray for the offering. Lord Father in heaven, you bless us with so much. So Lord, we come before you now with the offerings that we have that come from the heart. Lord, would you bless the giver and bless our tithes this afternoon that you would just accept it for the furtherance of your kingdom lord for some of us it may be just the smallest amount that we can give but lord father we know that it's a sacrifice with so many things that are going on in our financial situations but lord we know we are faithful that you are here to bless us with many more so lord father we we give this time we give up our our offer offerings to you this afternoon that you would just bless it lord in the mighty name of jesus we pray Let us all rise and let us sing the doxology. Let's sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, We have children's shirts. Children. We are still in our study of uh, David. David is called the man after God's own heart. How do you say that in Tagalog? Huh? Santaong. <laughs> a man after God's own heart. After 
<laughs> okay, I'd like to ask those four people in the back. Come on, there's a lot of vacant seats here. Come on. Don't be shy or else shame on you. <laughs> okay, that's good. Thank you. <clears throat> David, a man after God's own heart. This is our sermon series. And our text is found in uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 22. We've been uh, reading this every Sunday. In fact, this is uh, what God said about David. He said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which had fulfilled my will, all my will. Praise the Lord. David is such kind of a person, a man after God's own heart. But the thing is that God wants every one of us, every one of his children, to become a person after his own heart. Ah, God wants me to become a man after his own heart. And God wants you to be a man or a woman after his own heart. So this is what we're studying today. And uh, we're now on the fifth of the series, which I entitled True Greatness, which is found in 1 Samuel chapter 18, that's our text from verse 5 to verse 16. And I suggest that uh, when you uh, throw up the week, okay, anytime during the week, just go ahead and read 1 Samuel, okay, so that you can be abreast, you can be uh, updated on what we're going to talk about every Sunday. So here's the question. How do you measure greatness? Is the person who has a lot of money great? <laughs> great because, you know, he can share some with you. <laughs> How about a person who, uh, is greatness determined by a person who owns a good, big, expensive car? Or is it, or greatness is determined by how big your house is, or how high your social status is. Is greatness recognizable by one's achievement in life? Like, for example, uh, educational uh, achievement, like you finish your bachelor's and then finish your master's and then you're now uh, going to graduate with a doctorate degree, is that greatness? How about in a, if an actor wins a, an Oscar award or an Academy Award? Or even an athlete hmm? breaking long-standing status of other athletes. If someone is able to do what no one else can do, or what no one else has ever done before, have they achieved greatness? Well, some would say yes. But God would say no, I believe. Why? Because true greatness is not measured by what you achieve in life, but how you live your life. How you live your life. One of the greatest uh, person in the Bible whom God has appreciated is Job. Okay? And God declared Job's greatness like this. Job chapter 1 verse 8 which says, There is none like him. God is talking about Job. There is none like him on the earth. A blameless an upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Guess what? We can see this greatness also in the life of David, the person whom we are studying right now. And so in this passage, in the first Samuel chapter 18, 
David was just a young lad, but his, he has achieved greatness. And I'm going to share with you some observations from David's life revealing why he achieved true greatness. So let me just share with you those things that we can observe in David's life. The first one is with regards to the presentation of David's life. Well, three times in this chapter, it says David behaved himself wisely. David behaved himself well. You'll see that David is, is on the way to promotions. He's being promoted step by step up to the point that when God has, has ordained him to be the king of Israel. And so we see in verse 5, it says, So David went out whenever Saul went, sent him and behaved wisely. And so set him over the man of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. David behaved wisely. You know, when we talk of behavior, it's something that, that people observe about you. Okay? It's not something that you, you know about yourself in private, but behavior is something that you show before people. Ugali. Pago ugali. And he said, and the Bible says, he behaved wisely. There is a wisdom in the way you perform, the way you act, the way you uh, carry yourself. Some people are very knowledgeable. Too much knowledgeable that their minds are filled with information, with data. Okay? But their lives are ruined. The way they live, the way they behave is without wisdom. Why? Because wisdom is the proper application of knowledge. And David was... A person who knows a lot of things, but at the same time, his life shows it. His behavior shows it. Of course, you know that David defeated Goliath, that giant. And he continued to prove himself to be faithful, loyal subject day by day. David did not allow the victory over the Philistine to go into his head. David knew he was climbing to the top. But he was willing to take the climb one step at a time. You know, there is always danger when we see some measure of success in our walk with God. When God allows us to see victory or two, and we need to be, be, beware ourselves of the snare of pride. There's a tendency for us, humans, to take pride on what's something that uh, happens to us. According to Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, it says, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. In the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. So David behaved himself in whatever situations. Like, for example, another, another verse in verse 14. It says, and David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Even when Saul 
tried to kill him. Well, it's, it's easy to behave properly when everything is moving fine. But when there, there's something that's going on, you know, there's tension, there's struggle, we forget about the behavior. Saul tried to kill him. But he carried himself in the right way. If I were David, I will probably be bitter. I could have taken revenge against uh, Saul. Saul was my boss at work. David was working for Saul. Often, problems of life throw us off course. Like, for example, some unexpected calamity will come to our way, and before we know it, we lose our behavior, our right behavior. A sign of true greatness to continue to walk in the right way, on the right path, in spite of when things are going wrong. Remember the Apostle Paul himself mentioned this in one of his letters in Philippians chapter 4, verse, verses 12 and 13. said, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be, in po- to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see that? Going back to Job. Remember Job. He lost everything. His family and even his own health. And this was said. And he said here in Job chapter 1 verses 20 and 21. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. Oh my God. (laughs) Many Christians nowadays, when things go wrong in their life, they forget about going to worship. (laughs) But you will notice Job lost everything. Even his own family, and the first thing he did is to worship God. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But at the same time, you see in the the life of, of David... Because of his uh, dedication to God. There are a lot of possibilities. He was very talented. He was a good uh, soldier. In verse 30, for example, it says, And so it was, whenever they went out, that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name became highly esteemed. He was looked up. He was respected. He was, people are, were impressed by him. And so David has, through the providence of God, became far more popular than the king himself. David was married into, in the king's family. David has been blessed and he has prospered greatly in Israel. He is in a position to attempt an overthrow of Saul's kingdom. In fact, because, he, because of his uh, being famous among the Israelites, he was in the position to take over the kingdom. But he didn't. But instead of trying to elevate himself, David is content to wait on the Lord. And she continues to carry himself well in spite of the opportunity to promote himself. And so we must be very careful when it seems that uh, 
For example, if you are on your way up on that uh, progressive ladder, there's a tendency for us to blow our own, our own horn. <laughs> In Tagalog, there's a tendency for us to uh, yung magdala na sarili nating bangpo. Okay? To be proud about uh, ourselves. But if we are really wise and we are really walking properly, we will leave the horn tooting to the Lord. Amen. Let the Lord do it. We hear of a lot of people who uh, who's fond of uh, showing off. And sometimes uh, it becomes a way by which they fall down. The Bible says, with regards to love, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5, says, love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. And so David may have been a young man, but he set a kind of example that we all need to know. He lived a wise and balanced life for the glory of God. He lived a life that honored God and a life that God could honor. I don't know about you, but I am interested in living that kind of life also. And so true greatness with regards to David, is can be determined in the presentation of David's life, but also with regards to the priorities of David's life. When we say priorities, it means what was first in his life. Another example of greatness of David's young life is the priorities that he has established and exhibited in his life. And these are not easy days for David. Because uh, for one thing, he is no longer he was uprooted from his own family, he's living in the palace. And he instantly found fame when he killed Goliath. He became famous for that. And that he also found a bitter enemy in the palace himself, itself, which is King Saul, who wants to kill him. But still, David remains faithful in his priorities. He carried on his assignments in spite of all the difficulties he faced. Notice how David demonstrated his faithfulness in, his, in the priorities of his life. In verse 10, it says, So David played music in his, with his hand and at other times. That was his assignment. He was, he was hired and employed by the king to play music for him. And he faithfully has done that. And it's easy to faithfully do something that you were assigned to do hmm, if everything is going along fine. But you will notice in this verse that he was doing that, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. It's just like a soldier that, uh, you know, when you are in target, you know, or it, <laughs> what do you call that in there? In, in, when when uh, that's, a, that's a, uh, a laser light target, and you see the target right there. <laughs> Wherever you go, there's <laughs> you are being targeted. Can you, can, you, can you be at peace, and can you do your job well when 
there's a there's a target right there at your back. And that's that's exactly what this one is it, it means. He was doing his job, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. David knew the king was against him. And still, David walked into the throne room, picked up the harp, and played his music. He had a job to do, and he did it faithfully. Priority. Like in verse 11. And Saul cast a spear, finally, you know, Saul cast a spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. You know why Saul hated David very much? Because David killed Goliath. He became so famous. People want him. But David was able to avoid the spear. But in spite of that, David continued faithfully what he has assigned, what has been assigned to him. Verse 13. <clears throat> Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came, came in before the people. Still, David was very submissive to his boss. In spite of all that, even after Saul attempted to take his life, David kept on serving this evil king. He took his new assignment and carried out his assignment to the best of his ability. And with these verses, we can see that David sets a good example for you and me to follow. And very often, the, the, the difference between an average Christian and a great Christian comes down to a simple matter of priority. What is your priority? Are you an average Christian who is wavering in your priorities in life? You see? We do things that are important to us. Yes? Yeah. We do things and accomplish things that are important to us. Those things you attach value, value to determine the priorities of life, of your life. Everything in your life is touched by this principle. What is important to you, you do. What's not important to you, you just ignore or neglect. For example, your church attendance will be determined by what priority it holds in your life. Yes, going to church is important. But what if something comes up that's more important? I don't know what that is. To me, when it's Sunday, the Lord's Day, number one is to worship Him. So, same is true with your prayer, your time with God. Is it important to you? Then if it's really important to you, you put that number one. Number one priority. Bible study and even sharing Christ. David's standard of living is one from which we could all take this lesson. David had determined to be faithful in spite of other things, in spite of injury, in spite of trouble, in spite of difficulty, he would still be faithful in his priority. In fact, here's what the Bible says in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, Immovable, always abiding, abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And sometimes we think that uh, we do those uh, 
activities that were assigned to us in church. And sometimes we think, there's no point in doing this. Only a few people come, and uh, only a few people participate. It's useless to do these things. Let me tell you something. As long as you do it for the Lord, for his honor, for his glory, your labor is never Amen. in vain. Amen. Amen. Hindi sayang yung ginagawa mo sa Panginoon. Basta ginagawa mo yun sa Panginoon. If you're doing it for the Lord, your labor is not in vain. That's what the verse says. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I guess what we were guilty of allowing everything else in this world to hinder us, to hinder our walk with God, which should not be the case. Be faithful in whatever God has assigned to you. Remember your priority. Okay? So true greatness of, of uh, David, we can find this with regards to the presentation of his life, with regards to the priorities of his life, and thirdly, we find this in the perception of David's life. David's greatness can only be seen in how he was perceived by people and how he perceived himself. Like, for example, uh, King Saul. How did he perceive David? Well, let's read some ver verses. It says, verses 7 to 9, says, So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. <laughs> if I were Saul, if I heard this, I was, why? Then Saul was very, very angry, saying, displeased him, and this saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me, they ascribe only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And so David eyed, uh, Saul, David, Saul eyed David from that day forward. So, in Tagalog, masama na ang tingin niya kagad. Masama na ang kanyang tingin. No? He, he, his look against uh, David was, was bad. Verse 15, it says, Therefore, when Saul... When, when, when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him, David. He got afraid. Fear. I don't know what was the reason why. Perhaps fear that, you know, he might take over the kingdom. Verse 29. And Saul was still more afraid of David. So Saul became David's enemy continually. So the perception of Saul against David is that he's, he's uh, not good for him. He's an enemy. He was jealous of David. And so, and so, so Saul hated David and wanted him, him dead. That's Saul's perception with regards to David. His position as king is threatened every time David is around. Okay? You'll probably experience this when a person comes around and threatens your position at work. And that's exactly the feeling of Saul. But how about the people of Israel? Well, Saul's servants were very much impressed by David. 
Saul's subjects, all the people saw God's hand on David's life and they were impressed with him. But how about Saul's son, Jonathan, and Saul's daughter, Michael? Well, of course, we studied Jonathan. Jonathan loves David very much. And, and the daughter, Michael, fell in love with David and they became husband and wife. There is something about his life that touches them as well. They were impressed by David. But what is more important is how David perceived his own self. Well, in verses 18 to 23, 18 and 23, you find here that the only person in Israel who seemed to be unaware of David's greatness was David himself. When it is mentioned that he might become the king's son-in-law because he's going to uh, marry uh, Saul's daughter, David speaks about his own unworthiness. For example, verse 18, so David said to Saul, who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? And then in verse 23, so Saul's servants spoke those words in the hearing of David. And David said, does it seem to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing I am poor and lightly esteemed man? You see David's humility and, and feels unworthy of being part of the family of the king. David near, isn't nearly as impressed with David as the others were. So here is the most important secret of obtaining great greatness. The person who possesses true greatness will be the last one to know it. <laughs> will be the last one to know it. And all around us, people are always concerned about who is greater than who. Right? They're always uh, looking and talking about themselves and their achievements, lifting their own selves, carrying their own bangko. Huh? <laughs> so that people will look up to them But the fact remains that greatness does not depend on achievements or whatever we say about ourselves. In fact, the person who is really great will be amazed when others lift his name and talk about his greatness. This was the kind of spirit that David possessed. And it is the same spirit that we should all strive to have within us, being humble. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. It's the Apostle Paul talking about himself here. I have become a fool in boasting. You have compelled me. For I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing... Was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing? I believe he was one of the greatest apostles. Who could have written more than half of the New Testament other than Apostle Paul? But he says, I am nothing. And the Bible has something to say about this matter of self-perception. For example, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 2. A good suggestion to all of us. Let another man praise you, and not your own mouth. A stranger, and not your own lips.
Have you ever tried to praise yourself? I did once, and I was looking at the mirror. Guapo ko talaga. The mirror broke. <laughs> right? Just kidding. But let others do the praising for you. Especially God. Let God do that, the praising for you. Do not praise yourself. Do not lift yourself up. Proverbs 26 verse 12. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. And then the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. For we dare not class ourselves with those that command themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. And there is that tendency. I think we always catch ourselves comparing Hmm? Comparing yourself to others. Oh, they, she has a better car than me. Or she has a better uh, singing voice than me. <laughs> Compare. Stop comparing. You get in trouble by comparing. You... you when you find out that he, he or she is better than you, then you look down on yourself. Hmm? When you find out that, that she is, uh, he or she is uh, uh, lower than you, not better than you, but uh, lower than you, then you have a tendency to be superior thinking about that. And start looking down at that, peop that kind of people. Listen to this. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18. It says, For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the, Lord's, the Lord commended. In fact, it is unwise to listen too closely to what others say about you. Because they cannot always say anything about you. What is important is what God says about you. Yeah. Okay. So true greatness, as we find in David's life, is found with regards to the presentation of his life, with regards to the priorities of his life. Thirdly, with regards to the perception of his life. And lastly, which is the crux of the matter here, the most important, the foundation is number four, the power of David's life. Verses 12 and 14 of the same passage, it says, Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. You see, David presented himself in the right way, had his priorities in the right order, and had a proper perception of his own life because his life before God was in order. See? And that's where the, the power comes. All of these other things were possible in David's life because of his relationship with God, which it ought to be. When you get uh, right down to it, a right relationship with the Lord is the first and essential step on the pathway of greatness in life. What is the relationship that David had with the Lord? For one thing, just read one of 
one of his psalms, because most of the psalms was, was written by David. One of the greatest psalms that David wrote, Psalm 23rd. And I, I'm so glad because my mother, who is almost 90 years old, she cannot remember all his children, but she can remember to recite Psalm 23rd. And the very first word, the very first sentence in Psalm 23 is, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It shows a very intimate and profound relationship that David had with God. God is my shepherd, I am one of his sheep, and I shall not want. I have everything I need. That's what he was saying. An intimate personal relationship that he had with, with God. His relationship with God, with God was not based on because my father and mother were, were believers in God and so I'm also part of that relationship. No? Or even because the prophet Samuel, uh, he, he has a relationship with God and I also have a relationship with God. No. His relationship with, with God is a personal thing. It's not because others have the relationship with God and, and, they will, and he will also have a relationship with God. I'm not talking about going through a ritual or going to church or becoming a member of a church or, or having a religion. It's having a relationship with God. David knew God in a personal way. And that made all the difference in his life. According to the verse, God was with him. And that, that, that the phrase alone, God was with him, is a very loaded phrase. That means all the resources of God is available to him. David was able to do all the things that he did because God was with him. He had favor with men because God was with him. He had humility and grace in his life because God was with him. And so if you would like to be great in this life, the first step will be found in your relationship with God. I'm not talking about whether or not you were baptized or, or you went through a ritual or so on. It's a personal relationship. Salvation is the key ingredient in achieving true greatness in life. If you were to die tonight, do you know where you're going? You see, you might be able to amass wealth and fortune. You might be able to... Uh, uh, have fame, you're famous with, with so many people, and have a good status among all men. Your name might, might be a household word, but if you are not saved by the grace of God, you are nothing. When this life ends, and it will, what will you have to show for your life? Nothing. but eternity in hell if you don't have a relationship with Christ. And so let me emphasize this. True greatness is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There are so many people in this world who are not famous, but they're great. You may not be great in the eyes of of many people. And you will never be great in their eyes. But you are leaving a legacy of greatness. Why? If you know the Lord, 
and through his work in you and through you, you are doing great things. And he will do great things through you. There are many others who passed this way who were not great in, many, in the eyes of many people. But they have left a mark. of greatness to the lives of others. Why? Because they knew the Lord in a personal way. And the Lord used them for great things. And so, don't worry about getting your names in the lights. Don't worry about grabbing the headlights. Don't worry about being known by men. The best thing in life is living for Jesus and allowing him to live his life through you and make an impact in the community where you live, in the family that you belong, in the church that you attend, and in the world that you live. True greatness is knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior and living out your life for him. And so in closing, some final thoughts once again. Is this. You must settle this question once and for all. I know many of you have a personal relationship with Christ because I see the results of that relationship. But if you're not sure of that personal relationship, why don't you settle it today? All you need to do is to trust in Jesus as your Savior. In fact, all of us need Savior, right? Because all of us are sinners. And we need Savior. We need Jesus. Amen. Trust Him to save you. And to forgive your sins. Next is this question. Would you like to live a life of greatness? And live a legacy of true greatness? Of course. Then is what you must do. Behave yourself well, or behave yourself wisely in every situation. And I, I would like to emphasize that you cannot do this on your own. You need, when Christ is in your heart, you need his spirit to lead you and to guide you. The Bible says, and the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Walk in the spirit. And you will behave wisely wherever you go. Do not just behave yourself well when people are watching. Okay? Like today, my wife is here, so I need to behave well. <laughs> I've been behave I'm behaving well, even though she's not here. Right? Okay? <laughs> but what is more important is that Jesus in the person of the Holy Spirit can give you the power to do what's right, to choose what's right. Secondly, establish your right priorities and live by them. What is your priority in life? The Bible says, Matthew 6, 23, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Keep God number one and his concerns number one in your life. The Holy Spirit will help you establish those. And then lastly, have a proper perception of who you are. Who are you? I am a child of God. That's your one and foremost 
identity in life. I am a child of God. How do you perceive yourself being a child of God? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for speaking to our hearts through the life of David. Thank you that uh, it's been recorded in the Bible, that we can read it, meditate on it, study it, and even the valuable lessons that come from it. We can apply these lessons in our own lives. Help us, dear Lord, to be the kind of people, persons that you want us to be. That you'll continue to uh, reign supreme in our lives. That we may honor you and glorify you in all things. Help us to uh, establish and develop true greatness in the way we live in our lives. For well, this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us all rise.